The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. I just want to say that first, I'm not the author really on this presentation. The work was done by Pierre Claver at uh, NRC in Canada. And he did this work, I believe, about five years ago. And this here was the presentation. When he started working with this, it followed the work in Canada where they started working on uh, Portland limestone cement. And a lot of people were asking questions about what we're going to see in concrete if it's not interground with the cement, but it's added separately. So this is what initiated this work. But the first slides here, I'm going to go through them very fast because the people from uh, Hubert have already presented all of this. So calcium carbonate is one of the most common mineral on Earth, and it's uh, come in a powder form. It's used in all uh, industrial applications. So different applications, plastic, paint, paper, rubber, adhesive, food and pharmaceutical, water treatment, landscaping, cultured marble, everything else that uh, our friend from Hubert has presented before. So at ACI, we've already talked about this. I'm the last speaker after two days, so a lot of this is going to be the same thing. But the mineral filler definition that we have here at ACI is a finely divided material product, and at least 60% of this uh, passes the U.S. standard of 75 micron, the number 200 sieve. So there's different type of it. We've just heard a presentation of a product that comes from a manufactured sand, a product that we call dust of fracture, and at ACI is going to be our column C, in uh, the table that Lane Shaw presented earlier. And then the calcium carbonate ground product that we've heard uh, many presentation uh, in the last couple of days about. And this is the product here that is being used is a ground calcium carbonate. So they come in different grind and uh, size or D50, like uh, we've seen that there's some 10 micron, 3 microns. It always depends on the time and length of their grinding process, and we can optimize all the compaction for the cement base and also the aggregate base. So that's the idea when using these different products is optimize your packing density. When we started this work, or here five or six years ago, when I started trying to initiate the creation of the document at 211 and the ASTM standard, it was because there was nothing here in North America that allowed us to use these products to enhance the properties of concrete. While in Europe, it had been used in just about every application for the last 25 years. In Canada, and I'm Canadian by the way, OPC cement had already 5% cement or limestone into our cement interground. But in the US, it was still not accepted or used until recently. In France also, and in Europe, and I, but I believe in France, there's two grades. The SAM2s have 5 to 20% also, and there's another grade that has up to 35% reduction clinker. But the big difference is that those SAM2 cement in Europe are not ground very fine. They have blades that are very similar to the regular OPC, while here our cement companies, when they created the PLCs, are grinding them to a, an equivalent performance of a regular type 1 cement. So they can go now, even if it's part of the 595 blended cement, they are equivalent in performance, or at least this is what they are marketing them like. And of course they are, because we've seen a lot of that presented as far as their performance, they're very similar to a uh, type 1 cement. A lot of people were asking, well, what if I want to add it separately and not buy it already interground? What kind of performance am I going to have if I replace a certain portion of cement with it? Well, we've seen that if we optimize our blend and if we optimize our aggregate, we are able to reduce the pace in our concrete and obtain the same performance. The problem here in the U.S. and often and sometimes in Canada, we're limited with the aggregates that we have, and we cannot optimize that well our gradation to reduce our pace. So what do we do? We add more cement. Everybody does that. More cementitious. Now, it's not necessarily Portland cement. It can be fly ash or slag, because that's what we count entirely into our cementitious is cement. And our cementitious is fly ash and slag or silica fume. 
Here in the US, we have minimum cements and specification in just about everything, which is not the case in Canada, for example. Canada does not have minimum cement. All they have for durability is a maximum water to cement ratio. So that allows the ready mix producer to optimize their own mix and put as much cement as they want. A lot of people in Canada talk about water to cementitious or water to powder ratio, water to binder ratio. But in the places where we can't optimize our aggregate, everybody uses more cement or cementitious than they need. So we always get a lot more strength than what we need. I'll give you Georgia, for example. The DOT mix for the 4,000 PSI concrete has 611 pounds of cementitious and a 0.5 or something water to cement ratio. I believe it's 0.55, but they end up at these strengths that if you use straight cement are at 6, 7,000 PSI. Are you from Georgia? Yes. So I'm not crazy. I'm an admixture person. I know what they're doing over there. They don't need all this cement in there. Why do they have that? Because they have workability issue. They have very bad aggregate. They try to combine as much as they can, but this is what it is. So when you're forced to put that amount of cement in there just for workability, then what do you do? You are replaced. If you could replace cement in the mix like that by limestone filler, you can reduce your compressive strength. They only need 4,000 PSI. See, it's in that concept that we talk about replacing cement in this market. In Europe, it's different. You're dealing with high-performance concrete mixes all the time, and you have very low amount of cement minimum that are required. Canada doesn't even tell you what to put in there. So in that concept, you can say, oh, I'm talking about pace, I'm talking about binder, I'm talking about powder, just to optimize workability. But in the U.S., we're using cement for workability. We have a hard time making people understand that they need to talk about powder content. So that's the difference. So anyway, all of this to say that we've, Canada in 2008 moved towards the acceptance of a, uh, by wanting to reduce the CO2 emission in the cement, they forced the cement company to produce cement that is reduced in clanker, and now they have allowed up to 15% limestone filler or limestone interground in there. And then the CSA also allowed the use of uh, limestone filler as an addition to concrete, but it doesn't count in the cement. It's part of the aggregate, but it allows them to reduce cement if you are optimizing your workability. In the U.S., well, in uh, 2009, we created this committee here at ACI, the 211N, and like we've said, we've published our proportioning with limestone filler this uh, summer. And at ASTM, I'm hoping that we'll be able to produce a specification for ground limestone in the next six months, hopefully. And it might be sooner than that. And, of course, we have the uh, ASDMC 595 blended cement that since 2012, I believe, have allowed the underground limestone with the cement here in the U.S. So we have plenty of data that's available for self-consolidating concrete with the substitution of cement with the limestone filler. But we don't know anything about how is it going to perform in a regular concrete, just an everyday concrete. So that's what NRC tried to do here. So yesterday, for the people that were not in the room, Kamal have presented some data for self-consolidating concrete. And I wanted to repeat that to people just to emphasize a couple of things that he may not have talked about here. But in every one of these his mixes here, this is a, the cast-in-place SCC, the pre-stress, which was using a type 3 cement, the precast pre-stress, and then the precast architectural. He was using, every time, 10, 15, or 20 percent replacement. This was a 3 micron limestone that he used, filler that he used in there. 10, 15, 20 percent replacement of the cement in here in his mix. Every time he reduced the demand in the high range water reducer. And I just want to say that he preferred to reduce the high range water reducer thinking that he's reducing the price of his yard of concrete by reducing the high range water reducer. That's his choice. He doesn't necessarily know, being a professor, the cost of all the other stuff that's going in the mix there. Sometimes the cement is so much more expensive that might as well reduce the cement and you reduce your water to cement ratio and you might compensate that tiny bit of strength loss by replacing 20% of the cement. And we're going to go through that soon. So you see here the reduction is more drastic when it's a type 3 cement. So here in the static stability, every time when it's a type 1 cement, the type 3 cement, it's different. 
But with the type 1 cement, every time he has reduced the cement by up to 20%, every time the static stability got better. So we have a better system, a self-sustaining product, more stable SCC. And another very interesting thing is the uh, reduction in form pressure or where the material itself uh, sustains it, which is very important for self-consolidating concrete application. Again, this was a up to 20% replacement in cement, and it's a 3 micron D50 product. So here we have the difference in compressive strength that we can see between the OPC and the 20% replacement. Every time they met the 32 MPA requirement, so that there's a little bit of a reduction in compressive strength, nobody really cares about that. We meet the requirement. The mix is a lot cheaper. We've taken 20% of cement out. Drying shrinkage, well, you replace cement, so you reduce the shrinkage. So in this particular case here, where we went and did the comparison, we had the GU cement, which is the type one, the GU is general use in Canada. And what he studied is a side-by-side -side comparison where he took the GUL and he took a GU and replaced 10% because the GU already has 5% interground limestone. So we didn't want to use more. We just replaced 10% of that GU by a three micron and 17 micron and looked at the difference in performance in all kinds of just regular mix. Well, he went from a 0.35 or 0.4 water cement ratio, a 0.5 water cement ratio, and 0.7 water cement ratio. The reason why he chose these water cement ratio is, I don't know if you saw the presentation of Doug Hooten yesterday, but he had similar water to cement ratio mix in which he was doing the uh, sulfate attack. Because in Canada, the Thomas site, the sulfate attack, it's cold. Everybody was questioning the performance of the limestone interground cement with the Thomasite formation. So he decided to run the exact same mix that are typical in Canada for the different application where it could be exposed to sulfate. So cementitious content varied between 250 kilo, which is 420 pounds of cement, roughly, pounds per cubic yard, to 420 kilogram, which is more like 700 pounds of cement per cubic yard. Depending on the lower water cement ratio, he was shooting for about eight inch slump. Here, just to show you the blend for the GU type one cement, it's a 380, and then the GUL, like I was telling you before, they're ground a little finer because what is important here is equivalent performance. So the GUL is a lot finer. Specific surface, the blain, the passing 45 micron on both of the cement, and the specific gravity. So obviously when we interground limestone filler, we have a specific gravity of that cement that's a little lower than the regular cement. That changes your paste content if you do it by volume, just pound for pound replacement. So the way he did it, the way Dale did everything by doing things by volume is really the right way to do it, but not everybody does that. It's great when you do it like that. And in the lab, most people do that. I mean, in real life, the, uh, it's very rare that people are that sophisticated. They just go pound for pound and look at the performance. I wish everybody was doing it by volume, but not always the case. And if you try to explain that to the common person, sometimes they just look at you like, and it's, don't even go there. And then you can see that the compressive strength of those two cement, they're designed to be equal, and they are. So he ran the water to powder ratio of a 0.33 for the GU versus a GUL, and then he took the GU and replaced 10% with the 3 micron and the 17 micron. So we have here the mixed design, the aggregate, and the air content that he obtained, unit weight, and the slump of these mix. So you can tell that every time he put the limestone filler, in this case here, he didn't cut the water out. He just let it go because it was within his parameter of slump, plus or minus one inch. But if he had cut some water, he would have obtained higher strength, obviously, if he had gone a little lower, you know, another inch of slump lower. So workability is important to look at. But here we had enhanced workability. Here is the 0.45 water to cement ratio. Same thing, about the same workability, and uh, you look at the water content, everything the same, 10% replacement. Here the 0 0.66, 0 0.7 water cement ratio. So same thing, here again you can see these plus or minus one or one and a half in the slump, and air pretty much similar, and you can see the only place where I believe he had to reduce a little bit his water is when he used the uh, three micron. It ended up being so fluid that he was too high in slump and he cut some water out.
But if we look at the compressive strength here, they're all very similar at one day and 28 days. And the Coulomb, all very similar also from the general use, the GUL, and every one of them. Not much of a difference in compressive strength. That's a 0.33 water cement ratio. Straight replacement of cement, 10%. We didn't want to go higher because the GU already has 5% in it, and the GUL has up to 15%. This particular cement, I believe, came from Lafarge, but I'm not certain, so I would have to verify from them. But it has maybe 13% limestone total in it. The other one, when he did the freestyle durability, every one of them passed. It's not a surprise. They were all well entrained and had good spacing factor. And you can tell here the compressive strength again on this mix, very similar, and the Coulomb penetration also. This is a 0.65 water cement ratio. Again, typically it's very rare that these products are going to be used exposed to salt scaling resistance, but they could be exposed to freestyle. So they were air entrained, and again, everything passed and had very similar compressive strength. Actually, in this case, the GUL had a little bit lower strength. I don't know why, but everything else is very similar within one MPA of a compressive strength. Chloride ion permeability, all very similar. So this is just a graph of the same numbers I gave you. And then here the shrinkage. So what we had obtained also for all similar or better than the reference, that's the 0.35, that's the 0.45. So the GU and GUL are right here. And we have similar or better results. And this one here, see the GUL and the GU are here. And the two other products are here. So again, either similar or better results. And those are the salt scaling resistance. So I'm going to show you two pictures, only the 0.35 and the 0.45, because in Canada, when you're exposed to salt scaling resistance, 0.7 are never going to be used for exposure to salt scaling resistance. They have a maximum of 0.45. Here you can tell that all of those were passing the test, and all of them looked good as far as the appearance. Same thing for the 0.45. You have the GU here, the GUL, and the two product with the limestone filler in it. So as a conclusion, you know, we can see that performance side by side, that it is interground or blended or blended separately by the producer, we have very similar results in regular concrete. We had very good results in SCC, but nobody knew what it was going to do in just regular concrete. Can we go higher dosages of replacement? Well, again, it depends on what the mix design is and how much more cement are you using in your mix due to your bad gradation of aggregate. So in certain case, if you could use more replacement. But if you're well dosed and you have a good gradation and you have already a minimum cement, well, we might not be able to replace more than 15%. This is, I believe, why we have come up with that number. But in places where we have high-performance concrete and we're using very high volumes of cementitious or powder, yes, then we can optimize the amount of limestone filler that can be used. Slump retention is an advantage in some situation. In France, just like Pascal was talking before with their K-factor, they're allowed to count a portion of it as part of their cement. Here, we're not like that right now. We are limited in the amount of replacement. We can only count it in the aggregate. So the only part that we can use as a replacement of cement is when we're using excessive cement in our mixes because we have bad gradation. That's all we can do for now here, even though we're proving that we can do better. But this is only what we can do right now. But we also find that the higher performance are obtained with products that are ground and finally ground which is not usually numbers that we can obtain just with the dust of fracture. Dust of fracture are working in certain applications, but in others where enhanced performance and high performance concrete is needed, you end up having to use a better control or finer limestone filler. So that's it. Thank you.